Uh, let me just pray before we begin. Father, I ask that you would guide us today as we walk through a bad story. Help us to see in that something to turn us to, towards a good story. Speak to us, transform us, convict us, challenge us. Challenge me. We just ask that you would be here carrying us along. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I know we said we concluded the series on stories, but the more I thought about it, the more I thought, you know, I need to do something more because we talked about how to write a good story. We talked about what a story looks like. We, we said every story has a hero. Every story has a victim. Every story has some form of a guide, right? And every story has, what am I missing? Um, I said a guide. The villain, yeah, there's a villain in every story. Um, and I think that that is so true. And even in a conversation that I had with someone this week as they were talking about things going on in their lives, they started putting it in context with, I don't want to be the victim you know, that becomes a villain. I don't want to be a victim that stays stuck. And, and so uh, in my office, we had this great conversation and it just flowed with this natural language. And I'm thrilled that we're picking up this kind of language. But, but what do you do if you're living a wrong story, you know, and how do you know if it's the right story or the wrong story? I, I, I think about, you know, Moses, and, and man, he had it easy. God comes to him in a burning bush and says, go to it, back to Egypt and free my people. Okay, the task wasn't easy, but knowing what God wanted, like Moses had it. You, you, look at, you look at Mary and, and Joseph. You know, Mary gets told, you're going to have a baby. It'll be conceived by the Holy Spirit. And, and don't worry. You know, so you just need to raise this child, protect this child, because he's the savior of the world. So maybe what she had to do wasn't easy, but she kind of knew what she had to do. Joseph, you know, didn't know, but he gets a dream, and he's told in a dream, this is what to do. And, and later he gets a dream and says, go to Egypt, and he goes to Egypt, and later he gets a dream that says, come back, and, and he had it easy. He, he, he knew what God's will was. He was told what to do. Paul gets knocked off of his horse. His name is Saul at the time. He gets knocked off of his horse. He, and, and, and the voice from heaven speaks to him and says that you will be my witness to the Gentiles. And, and Paul maybe didn't have an easy job, but, but he knew what he was doing. God told him what to do. And then I start thinking, that's... What about us? I mean, one, probably one of the most common questions I hear from students and, and I hear from you is, how do I know God's will in my life? Because we don't have necessarily the burning bush, the, the dream experience, the knock us off the horse voice from heaven experience. We're not, we're not getting that. And so how do we know that we're living a good story? How do we know that we're not living a wrong story. At the time of the judges, Israel, the nation of Israel, was living a wrong story. The ending, the last verse in, in Judges says this, that in those days Israel had no king. Everyone did as he saw fit. Another translation says everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And, and this is what Israel was. They were, they were living a wrong story. And there's this character in the book of Judges. His name is Jophtha. And he, you know what? He was living the wrong story too. And we're going to spend some time talking about this character, 
Jotha. And what I'm going to ask you to do is ask yourself these same kind of questions. Is, am I edging towards living a bad story? Am I, am I falling into this trap? And, and Jotha was a victim. You know, when we talk about the story, Jotha was a victim. And, and, and here's how it begins. This is what we learn about uh, I'm, Jephthah. I'm saying Jotha. I mean Jephthah. Um, Jephthah, uh, the Gileadite, boy, there's Gileadites, Hittites, termites, uh, <laughs> it's, it's not easy. Uh, you need a seminary degree just to tackle some of these. So, so Jephthah, the, the Gileadite, was a mighty warrior. That sounds good. He's a mighty warrior, but that's what he became. The scriptures tell us more. His father was Gilead. His mother was a prostitute. Well, that complicates things, especially, especially back at this time. Gilead's wife also bore him sons. And when they were grown up, they drove Jephthah away. You're not gonna get any inheritance from our family, they said, because you're the son of another woman. So what can we take from this? Well, it's against the custom. The, a son gets an inheritance. A son is involved. And, and so why is it that the son, uh, Jephthah, why is it that something is happening? We can only assume that his father died and, and his brothers are older and he has brothers from uh, the person who was married to Gilead and we have Jephthah, who was the son of a prostitute. Um, and so they have this problem because they don't want him getting any of the inheritance. And so they uh, probably would go to the town elders, which were probably corrupt, and they created a law and an edict that disinherited him and caused him to be at risk. And so Jephthah fled from his brothers and settled in the land of Tob, where a group of adventurers gathered around him and followed him. The NIV is so kind here, a group of adventurers. If you look at other translations, the ESV translation would say worthless people. Uh, they are criminals, is every aspect. When you find this Hebrew word in other places, these are not people who you would want to invite for dinner. They're people who came and took dinner. And so Jephthah becomes this mighty warrior in this land of Tob, separated from his family, kicked to the ground, disinherited. Mother was a prostitute. He has all of the makings of a victim. And here he starts to grow strong as far as being a fighting man, a mighty warrior. And, and people around him begin, and there's this band of brothers that, that is floating around in this area. And my guess is that we would understand it better if we just said that they were like land pirates. And so this is Jephthah. And, and this is where he's living, and this is what's happened to him. Meanwhile, the nation of Israel is going through some difficulties as well, and we find this happening in Judges. It explains, again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. This is a saying that divides, this said six times in Judges, and dividing Judges out into six different, um, seven different sections. And, and so we find this. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They served the Baals and the Ashtoreths and the God of Aram, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the Ammonites, and the gods of the Philistines. And so we see that they're not following God. They're living a bad, a wrong story. And they're engaging with the gods of the land, the the Baals, the Ashtoreths. So Ashtoreth is a female goddess, and Baal is a, is a male god of fertility, and uh, very often children were sacrificed to the Baals. And, and so the culture all around them uh, was a culture that they were supposed to, that Israel was supposed to transform. 
and yet the cultures around them transformed Israel. Do you ever find that struggle in your life that the culture around you is beginning to transform you instead of you transforming the culture? This is what's going on with Israel. And because the Israelites forsook the Lord and no longer served him, he became angry with them and he sold them into the hands of the Philistines and the Ammonites who that year shattered and crushed them. I don't know what that means. What does it mean? God sold them. Did he, did he get paid? Did he get money? It's, it's not that kind of a term. But it's that kind of thing where when someone gets given over to alcohol and alcohol becomes their life, then alcohol becomes their, their master, right? And they become a slave to something. And so when we give over to our careers and, and that is all that we're thinking of and all that we're doing, then we become a slave to our job, to our bosses. And, and so in many ways, this is what's happening. They're giving their lives over to the gods of the land and the gods of the land are becoming their master. For 18 years, they're oppressed, all Israelites on the east side of the Jordan and Gilead, the land of the Amorites. The Ammonites also crossed the Jordan to fight against Judah, Benjamin, and the house of Ephraim, and Israel was in great distress. And so here's the picture. They give over to all of these gods and the lands all around them, and then they become the slaves once again. They came out of Egypt, and they have now become slaves all over again. And Israel is in great distress because this group of people, the Ammonites, have crossed over the Jordan, and they're setting up to attack. So just to give you an idea of where things are today, this is a map, a Google map of where things are today. This is a map of today, and here we see the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River, and the Dead Sea. And so Israel today is everything more or less on the left of that area. Um, but here's what's going on. Aram, these are the different gods of the people that we just saw listed. Aram is all up here in the north, up uh, towards Syria. Sidon is over to where Lebanon is. Moab is uh, to the east side of the Dead Sea. Ammon and the Ammonites, the, the two different groups, are found there. And the Philistines are where Gaza is right now, in that whole area. And this story is focusing around a group, a tribe of Israel, that's located on the eastern side of the Jordan, right there. This is where they're distressed. And what's happening now is the uh, Ammonites have crossed over the Jordan and they're setting up to uh, attack these Israel, which is what's there in black. And this is, the Ammonites are the ones that are doing all of this. And Tob is probably around there, maybe further north, and this is where Jephthah is living. So this is kind of a map of what's going on. And so I just wanted you to see the idea that they are surrounded by their enemies. And it's not a lot has changed. Um, the, the capital of Jordan is Amnon. So, so that still is uh, there today. And so all of this is happening. Uh, Jephthah has got his kind of life on his own. He's just living, living the life like, and, and you know, so many different movies that are out there. Somebody's in prison, you know, and somebody, you know, Rambo's in prison and they, they come to Rambo and they say, we have a special mission for you. And if, if you can conquer, you know, this, then, then we will set you free. We'll, 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 we'll cancel out your sentence or, or somebody is, you know, is, exiled and, and somebody comes and says, we need you if you come back, you know, and we see it over and over again in, in different movies. Well, that's what's about to happen here. The Israelites cried out to the Lord, we've sinned against you, forsaking our God and serving the Baals. Then the Lord replied, 
when the Egyptians, the Amorites, the Ammonites, the Philistines, this, uh, side, uh, let's see, Sidon, so Sidon means Sidonius, a word, the Amalekites, the Moites oppressed you and you cried to me for help. Did I not save you from their hands? So there's this history of all of these different, you know, nations, and, and God delivers them. And then he says, but you've forsaken me and served other gods, so I will no longer save you. Go and cry to the gods who you've chosen. Let them save you when you're in trouble. But the Israelites said to the Lord, we have sinned. Do with us whatever you think best. Doesn't it sound like when you were a kid and you didn't, you know, you, you were told there was going to be consequences, 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 you ignore it, you ignore it, and then all of a sudden you're cleaning your room, you know? <laughs> what is it that made you do that? Is it because you had this change of heart? Oh, I feel so bad that I didn't clean my room. So they're saying, we've sinned. Do with us whatever you think best, but... Please rescue us now. And they got rid of the foreign gods and they started to clean their room and, and make everything look neat. And there they said, and then this happens. The Ammonites are called to arms. They, they gather all of their army. They're called to arms in Gilead. And the Israelites assembled and camped in Mizpah. And so we now have two armies siding up for an eminent war. The leaders of the people of Gilead said to each other, whoever will launch the attack against the Ammonites will be the head of those living in Gilead. And they began to talk amongst themselves. Who, who could actually lead an army who is strong enough to take on such a formidable force who could we get who? and then they come crawling back to Jephthah and we find this sometime later when the Ammonites made war on Israel the elders of Gilead went to Jephthah from the land of Tob come they said be our commander so you can fight the Ammonites. Jephthah said to them, wait, wait a second, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, let me get this straight. Didn't you hate me and drive me out from my own father's house? Did, didn't you disinherit me? Didn't you pull some legal maneuvering and everything that, that forced me to flee from my life to Tob and I've been living here all this time? Is it, isn't, aren't you the same elders that did that to me? And, and the elders of Gilead said, nevertheless, uh, we're, we're turning to you now. Come with us, fight the Ammonites, and you'll be head over all of who live in Gilead. And, and so the exile returns. He makes the deal, and, they, and as you read the text, they, they try to soften it like they could be making him leader during the conflict, but pull the rug out from him on the, afterwards, and he's too smart for that, and he forces their hand and says, this is a lifetime thing. You bring me back, I'm back. And so they move him to, to Mitzvah, and, and the new house, and imagine his family going from running in caves and, and different places, and he, and he brings his family back, and they have a, the presidential suite, you know, they, they've got a house that has, you know, more than anything that they've had in the past, and, and this is a wonderful thing. And, and, and so Jephthah tries the diplomatic approach. And what we see in Scripture is that he sends a messenger. He must have written it down because it's hugely detailed. He sends a messenger and, and he says, why are you making war against us? I don't get it. And, and so they, they send the message back and they say, when you guys came up from Egypt, you took our land. And, and that's why we want it back. So give it back peacefully and we'll be all set. And, and so he sends a messenger again, and he explains in excruciating detail that they did everything possible to not go to war with them, that they traveled all around them, that they asked for permission to pass through their land, and that it wasn't given, and that it finally ended up in war, and they conquested, and they took the land. And, and, and 
So he ends by saying in his relation, you know, the diplomatic relationship that they, that they have, he ends by saying, if your God gives you something, do you possess it? That's what we're doing. And so there's this hint there that, that Jephthah's got a theology that is interwoven with the culture of these people that he's at war with. So the diplomatic approach doesn't work. And so the Spirit of the Lord comes upon Jephthah. He crosses the Gilead and Manasseh, passes through Medzpah of Gilead, and from there he advanced against the Ammonites. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord. If you give the Ammonites into my hands, whatever comes out of the door of my, of my house, whatever comes out of the front door, I will meet and return the, from triumph. He said, I will sacrifice as a burnt offering. Should have gone to the next slide. So out of nowhere, he makes this statement, and it can only be reconciled if we think of the relationship between the people and the other gods of the other nations, that there was always a bargaining point. If you do this, I will do that. And in extreme crisis situations, a human sacrifice was involved. And so he's, he's acting as though he was following a God similar to the gods that the other nations were following. And he says, deliver them into my hands, and whatever comes out of the front door of my house when I return in triumph, I will sacrifice to you. So 20 cities fall underneath Jephthah's rule. He attacks and he conquers, and 20 cities fall, and he comes home. He returns in victory. And when Jephthah returned to his home in Mitzpah, notice he's not in, in Tob anymore, he's in Mitzpah, who should come out to meet him but his daughter dancing to the sounds of tambourines? She was an only child. Except for her, he had no son or daughter. Can you imagine Jephthah coming home in victory, having a house full of perhaps servants? What are the odds? What are the odds that the person who comes out of the front door dancing with a tambourine would be his only child, his daughter? When he saw her, he tore his clothes and cried, Oh, my daughter, you've made me miserable and wretched because I've made a vow to the Lord that I cannot break. And so she says to him, if a vow came out of your mouth to the Lord, then you must fulfill it. Give me two months to go and roam among the hills to mourn my virginity. And in saying that, she's mourning that she would not have a child, that she wouldn't marry, that she, that she wouldn't have a life. That, and, and so for two months, imagine every day knowing in two months you're going to return and your father is going to sacrifice you on fire. Imagine Jephthah for two months knowing that he'll see his daughter again and when he does he's going to execute her. He's going to 
Sacrificer. This is a wrong story. What is this even doing in the Bible anyways? I, I'm really wondering, why would this even be included? I bet there was a lot of other people who did wrong things, and they don't find themselves in the pages of this book. Why is that even there? And what's really interesting is that when you read Jewish commentary, they don't talk about Jephthah. But, but the end, his daughter, his daughter is remembered in Jewish tradition. The, the next thing that we read, after he takes her, after two months, she returned to her father, and he did to her as he had vowed, and she was a virgin. From this comes the Israelite custom that each year the young women of Israel go out for four days to commemorate the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite. So, so Jewish rabbinic tradition, when you read about Midrash, that's commentary on the Jewish life and, and so forth, Jephthah isn't even remembered. The one who's remembered is the innocence of this daughter whose life was cut short, this only child who was sacrificed on the fire. I just can't stress this enough. This is a wrong story. How do we get there? How do we get there? Have you ever said something that just locks you into doing the wrong thing? What do you do when you're stuck like that? How do you get out of a situation like that? I mean, couldn't, couldn't Jephthah have done something different? Couldn't he have sacrificed himself? Couldn't he have done something? Couldn't he have done something? And, and, and we look at the scriptures, and, and, and I have to believe that Jephthah knew the scriptures because when he responded to the message, you know, of why he was uh, in the right, you know, when he was sending to the Ammonite king, when he was telling him, he gave specific detail about everything that happened as the tribe of Israel moved from Egypt up and around. Everything. He knew what was going on. It wasn't just that he was reading a history book and ignoring the Bible. In this day, the, the Bible and the history, uh, God's word was all that it was. So he knew Scripture. He must have known Scripture. And, and, and here there's this verse in Numbers that he must have focused on. When a man makes a vow to the Lord or takes an oath to obligate himself by a pledge, he must not break his word but must do everything he said. Locked in. He made an oath. He had to complete it. If, if you just look at his oath and you look at this verse in Scripture, you have to agree with me that he was locked in. He had no choice. He had to take his daughter's life. Maybe something else was available. Maybe Jephthah's problem was that he didn't have a grasp of all of Scripture, but he just had a grasp of some of Scripture. Because in Leviticus, it tells us this in chapter 27, the Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them, if anyone makes a special vow to dedicate persons to the Lord, and, and it just goes on that, that they can make an equivalent offering and get out of it. That there was actually a monetary value for a person who was vowed in some way, dedicated or some way like this, that there was a dollar amount that could be given. And, and it, if you detail the scriptures, sorry, men had a higher dollar amount than, than women. Um, they had that messed up too. Uh, but, but if anyone makes a special vow to dedicate persons to the Lord by giving equivalent values, they can get out of it. And so Jephthah had a way out. Not to mention, it says this in Leviticus. God says, do not give any of your children to be sacrificed to Molech. Molech is a Baal. That's a god of Baal. Do not 
give any of your children to be sacrificed to Moloch, for you must not profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. And so, so God is saying, don't do this. And, and, and so Jephthah is following through on something that God wants no part of. How could he not take that? How could he not have taken that out? He must not have known. Deuteronomy chapter 12 says, you must not worship the Lord your God in their way, the other people, because in worshiping their gods, they do all kinds of detestable things that the Lord hates. They even burn their sons and daughters in the fire as sacrifices to their gods. God is saying over and over again throughout the scripture, don't do that. And yet, he does. Now, now some commentators would say that, that he didn't really sacrifice her. He just made her a perpetual virgin that she could never marry. And, and that's why she was around for two months, roaming around, mourning her virginity. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense because he said he would offer her to Molech as a burnt offering. And then it says that he carried out his vow. So I don't think that that's true. And, and the thing is that if this is a wrong story, and I think it is, this has got to be a wrong story. If this is a wrong story, then remember a few weeks ago when we talked about the heroes of our faith? This whole chapter 11 that we said 24 different times that said, by faith, so and so. The heroes of our faith in, in Hebrews chapter 11 in the New Testament, the heroes of our faith lists out this, and what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell you about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised. What? Jephthah is listed in the heroes of faith and he doesn't understand that God doesn't want you to sacrifice your kids and, and he offers his kids, his, his only child he offers to the fire? What is he doing in there? Why is he in there? Why? Why? Grace is why. We are not saved by the things we do. We're saved because of what Christ has done. It says in Hebrews, at the end of all of this, it says they were all, all of this list, this huge list of names, they were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. So everybody in Hebrews that we talked about didn't see something that they were looking towards. Let me say that again. Everyone in Hebrews that's listed in this hall of faith, fame, didn't see something that they were promised. It tells us that Jephthah went on to judge Israel. There's a neat story about him conquering the, uh, in Ephraim. Uh, and then it just says that he judged Israel for six more years. And that's all we hear of Jephthah. But the writer said, the writer said, and what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell you about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah. Could there be more to Jephthah's 
story that's not revealed. Jephthah is listed in Hebrews because he saw something that he didn't receive. I wonder. I wonder if perchance Jephthah had a change of heart after doing the worst thing that anyone could think of doing. I, I wonder if he had a change of heart. I wonder if he cried out to God. I wonder if God shared with him about something that would happen, that he could identify with, something that Jephthah could identify with that would change him completely. I wonder if something happened where God said, and I don't see any other way his name could be listed here because it says that he was looking forward to a promise and we're told that that promise is what Christ did on the cross. I, I wonder if God revealed to Jephthah that God would send his only son to be sacrificed. <laughs> and it isn't an exercise that didn't accomplish anything. Jephthah sacrificed his daughter and it didn't accomplish anything. It's like, it's like it would be like me walking by this, the, the, a building that's on fire and, 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 and asking, is everybody out of the building? Is everybody out of the building? And everybody says, yes, we've checked everything. There's no one in the building. And I say, well, I'm going in anyway. And I run into the fire and die. It doesn't accomplish anything. And yet, if someone was in the building and somebody went into the building to rescue and to save those who were in the building, well, that's different. That accomplishes something. And, and could it be that, that Jephthah was made aware of a sacrifice that was to come that would not just accomplish something, but would forgive something? that would transform something. What if Jephthah was transformed by grace? And if that's true, then, then the bad story has a good ending. And so my challenge this morning as I just wrap things up quickly, perhaps you're wrestling with something this morning where Either you know you're out of line or you don't have a big enough grasp of what the scriptures are telling you. What can we learn from Jephthah's story? We need to be students of scripture. We need to understand the whole of God's word so that we don't pick and choose something and leave out the main thing. Are we really watching and, and studying and applying scripture in our lives. Ask yourself the question, when was the last time I really read it and ask God, how does it impact me? Because if we don't understand scripture, we're destined to do similar things than Jephthah. We may not sacrifice our children, but we may go down the wrong path. We may live a wrong story, but if we are aware of what truth is found in scripture, we we can turn that around and live a good story. Jephthah had every reason to turn out bad. In some ways, we can't blame him for what he did. He was a victim of the culture around him, and yet he finds himself listed in Hebrews 11. And we said in Hebrews 11 that Christ is revealed at the top and the bottom of that chapter as being the author and the perfecter of our faith. Let's pray. Lord, you are the author and perfecter of our faith. And, and Lord, you have given us scripture to guide us, to be our guide in the story, and yet so often we just set it aside. 
Lord, help us. Help us to be better students. Help us to be uh, mentored by you, willingly mentored by you, and, and help us to change our wrong stories to good stories, stories that advance your kingdom and have a purpose. Help us. We desperately need you. I need you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Children of God, what have we done? We've taken the truth and made it a weapon. How easy we forget what drew and pulled us in. It was not pointed fingers or proving me wrong that called and convicted me to come home. But kindness brought forgiveness. If we're gonna be 
Let it be.